Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We will call the City Commission Workshop for the City of Deltona on Monday, April 11th, 2022 to order. May we have the roll call, please? Commissioner Bradford? Here. Commissioner King? Here. Commissioner McCool? Here. Commissioner Ramos? Present. Commissioner Sosa? Here. Vice Mayor Avila Vasquez? Present. And Mayor Herzberg? Here. Now may we all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Commissioner King, would you like to lead us? to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This evening on our workshop agenda, we have one item of business, traffic calming techniques. Mr. Peters, this Thank is you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, for the record, I'm John Peters. I'm the Athens City Manager. Um, I'm also a professional engineer, so I think I'm, uh, with 40-some years of traffic calming, I think I am uh, can be considered an expert on the subject. And uh, so just want to go through all this. Um, before I get started, I provided copies of some traffic calming documents. I noticed on Facebook over the weekend, somebody made a point of noticing that the city of Atlanta standards go back to 1999. The reason I did that is I want people to understand that everything I'm presenting to you tonight for the most part is not new. Um, this has been something been going on for years. Um, so uh, with that, I will get started um, on these. There are three types of traffic calming. Uh, the first one is speed control measures. The second is volume control measures. And then the last one is safety enhancements. Under speed control measures, and I'm going to ask the fire chief to come up because this is an important one to me. Um, the first one is speed humps, speed tables, raised crosswalks, and raised intersections. Um, the next one is rumble strip, textured, or colored pavement. Then there's traffic circles or um, on street, um, on street parking, narrow lanes, bulb outs, and corner radii. Uh, the next one is chicane and traffic islands and medians. Uh, then we have landscaping and gateway features. We have radar signs and speed display boards, uh, and then signage. And then last is roundabouts. Roundabouts in the last few years have become a very popular measure, so I wanted to talk about that. Chief, if you could, um, I just want the record to know that in my 42 years, I have never put a speed hump, a speed table, a raised crosswalk, or a raised intersection. And I'm going to have the, uh, the illustrious chief here explain why I have not done such. Hi. Good, uh, good af afternoon or evening, wherever we're at. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, no, he, uh, Mr. Peters asked me to come up and talk a little bit on how it affects us with our responses and things like that. Um, any traffic control device that's going to slow the public down is obviously going to slow us down as well. Uh, when you're talking about speed humps, speed, speed tables, and uh, the raised crosswalks, um, we have to slow down to almost a, a crawl to get through that. And um, when we're talking about our ambulances, th they have to almost stop and just barely go over those humps uh, in order to keep from either jostling the patient or throwing the paramedic or EMT around in the back of the unit. Um, uh, it also uh, takes a toll on our equipment. We have expensive you know, fire engines and stuff like that that have to go over those bumps and stuff like that, so it does take a toll on that. And just to give you an example of, of how detrimental these things can be, including the, uh, the roundabouts, which the roundabouts ain't as bad, but um, if, you, if you've been down to Sanford lately along the Riverwalk, you know all of those speed tables that they put in and those raised crosswalks and those, those roundabouts. Um, that used to be our travel lane when our ambulances went to, to Central Florida Regional, which is now Lake Monroe Hospital. Um, 
we have quit going that way, and we go down and uh, go down and around now, which is probably about another mile or maybe even two miles longer to go around that way than it is to go straight through. But it's faster for us because we have to literally stop the ambulance and crawl over those things every time we go across that kind of stuff. So um, I would not recommend any of that type of stuff. I mean, even even to the extent of uh, Providence Boulevard where we put the median in here not too long ago, um, even, even that between uh, Tivoli and Saxon, um, even that slows us down now because traffic can't get out of the way. There's no place for them to go. So we have to slow down to almost a stop because nobody's gonna go completely off the roadway. So when you're looking at speed measuring devices or slowing devices, um, really all of them as a whole definitely uh, reduce our response times. Uh, the humps and the tables and the raised crosswalks are probably the worst for us um, for those reasons. Thank you, Chief. You're welcome. Um, hang on one second. Commissioner Bradford, you have a question? Yeah, so if you can't use the spread humps, herbs, curbs, bumps, sides, what do you recommend? Like how do we slow the traffic down? Because I know even Lob Lolly had done a petition, and I think you remember that, John, we sent it over, and you know, they've got, that's, that's Amber Ridge. Um, they actually have, I'm gonna say teenagers, these guys are probably familiar with them that just love to drag through there. Yeah. Um, obviously, I understand not having them, but what would you recommend to, to reduce the speeds? Honestly, I, I don't know that I can really give you a real recommendation. Maybe the, the sheriff's department might be a little bit better off for that. Um, you know, the only thing I can say is, you know, enforcement, um, you know, having a, a better presence, or not a better presence, but a, a more heavy, heavy presence out there to kind of, slow these people down when you start, you know, throwing $250 tickets at people, you know, that tends to slow people down uh, some, at least for a while. Um, but honestly, I, I wish I, I could tell you um, on what we do to slow people down, but it's really not my expertise on that kind of thing. It's just more, you know, for tonight, it was more about how it would affect us if we did put these types of things in. Thank you. Commissioner McCool. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> I, I have a problem with that because um, I go over to Tampa, right, and then neighborhoods in Tampa have these speed humps, have traffic calming devices through residential areas, okay? I'm always teachable, so I want to be teachable about this. To my mind, the ratio of incidents that this would prevent as opposed to the ratio of incidents where you're going to have to have emergency vehicle crossing over that in a residential area. It, it, out, it out, to me, it outweighs that. The need, the necessity for this, for if we talk about the patient load in that area, I'm gonna use Loblolly only because the commissioner brought it up. I'm gonna use that, okay? The traffic going back and forth, okay, there, as opposed to how many patients we've told across that same area, we have to weigh the, the good for the most amount of people. That's what we're taught here, right? And I'm sorry that we would have to slow down, but it would also, in my mind, slow things down enough that, that they're causing these issues, speeding in residential areas. Because we've had close calls, I hear it all the time simply because they can get a running head start and speed through these neighborhoods. So I'm wide open for whatever measure. Um, I don't know that we have as many emergency incidents as we do total amount of, of constituents. So I need to be sold on that. I need to be taught why for the other 95,000 people or the people that live in that neighborhood that we have to tell them no because it'll it'll slow down EMS. I don't understand the ratio of incidents well, for that. I, I would agree with you in concept as far as like the auto accidents and things like that where a car is involved, that type of stuff. But the medical emergencies to the houses, to the residents themselves, people having heart attacks, strokes, seizures, uh, you know, and us traveling to residences, um, that's where it would probably slow us down in, in the long run. I, you're, you're 
your premise makes sense to me, that if we're slow the traffic down, that there may be less auto accidents and maybe less pedestrians being hit. Um, uh, the premise seems logical to me for that. Um, but the other part of it is, is, the, is the people that we actually respond to in homes. Um, those are the ones that we'd be slowed down to, not only going to the home, but then going to the hospital afterwards. So. And, and I listen, I value every single life. I'm not trying to place value, life no, value, no. one above the no. other. That's not my thing. But in serving the most amount of people, we have residents, whole streets that have gone to get over on Ferrandina, whole street, getting petitions to slow people down as they turn into Lake Baton Estates. They get a run and start down that hill. I've been there. I've had somebody that had a door torn off for that. But there needs to be a traffic calming device. We need to get to a point where we can do this because Commission, it's not in our neighborhoods. I'm sorry. If you could let me go through this because there's a sure. lot of different devices. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the pros and cons of each one. Sure. And my hope is at the end we can have a narrow list of uh, traffic calming that we would consider in the city of Deltona. Yeah, I, I, thank you. The Mr. vice Peter. mayor is on the board, and I'm going to let her speak, and then we'll go back to you. No, I'll let, uh, you do you good? Okay. Yes, thank I'll you very Mr. much, Peter Chief. Stone. Appreciate your insight. Thank you. The first device. Uh, there's a photo here. It's a little uh, dark, but this is a raised crosswalk, but it's also a speed table. Um, they do work in terms of slowing people down as opposed to a, a feed hump. A feed hump, people learn over time, they can just drive the regular speed over them, and it does not impact you uh, as much as a feed table does. Um, so it does work. The negative is that quite often they create a drainage problem because it's hard to get the drainage to go by these uh, facilities. Um, second of all, people who uh, hit it for the first time or the second time uh, will usually bottom out when they go over it. They dig up the pavement on the other side. We end up with water getting into the base, and then we end up with base failure and the pavement failure that goes with it. And as the chief said, uh, it has a drastically negative effect on response time because typically with these things, you have to have them about every five to 600 feet, because what people will do otherwise is they will speed up to make up for the lost time for the one they just went over. So these have to be put on a pretty regular segment. So you can imagine if the fire truck had literally come almost to a stop to go over each one, and you just like they have on Riverwalk over in Sanford, you know, they have them periodically along the way so you don't um, uh, you know, get people to speed up afterwards. The next one is the raised intersection. Uh, this is where the entire intersection is raised up. Um, what it does is it serves several purposes. Most accidents occur at intersections. By raising the intersection, um, it is more evident as you're coming up on an intersection. It slows people down through the turning movements and all that on intersection. Uh, but once again, like with a fire truck, it slows you down. Once again, it's difficult to make the drainage work well. Um, most of these examples of these things are in highly urbanized uh, cities like in downtown Orlando or in Atlanta or Tampa, um, so this is not something that I would recommend. Now you're getting into what I would recommend. Um, the lane choke or intersection bulb outs. Uh, what this does is it narrows the pavement, especially at intersection or mid block, you narrow the pavement down. Uh, it is well known traffic engineering principle that you know, 12 foot is an ideal lane width. If you go wider than 12 feet, you know, people think it's a super highway and they can really go fast. But if you narrow the lanes down to, to 11, 10 and a half feet, people become uncomfortable with how much space they have and they slow down. Prime example 
is what the county did out on Saxon uh, near Finland. I know everybody thinks it uh, is not a good thing, but I can assure you I have noticed a dramatic decrease in traffic speed. The perception out there of traffic being congested is a byproduct of the traffic being speed being lowered because of the congested feel. Um, and that's one of the problems with doing something like that on a major arterial or collector highway is you have very high traffic volume and when you slow down a very high traffic volume, you end up with congestion. Uh, so we have to be very careful where these are applied. Um, and as a general rule, you do not do traffic calming in any way, shape or form on arterial highways such as Howland, Saxon, Doyle, um, Providence. Uh, those are generally not places you want to do it unless it's near an intersection where people are already going to be slowing down. This is um, lane narrowing, chicane, and landscaping all combined in one thing. If you look at the picture, uh, this road was a pretty straight road with a slight curve in it. They put a landscape median in the middle to force people to do what we call a chicane with kind of an S curve. Um, the lanes are narrowed down with the landscaping and the curbing. So when you come through this area, you will slow down. Um, and so this is a very effective technique on a more local road or even up into a minor collector road. Uh, to slow traffic down. And it's actually appealing to the eye uh, for the neighborhood. The next one is a pure chicane. Hmm? What? I just want to ask a question. Yeah, go ahead. Mr. Peters, if you could, for the sake of um, relevance as we go along, um, could you just call out a road? Because, you know, people are listening. Like, if there is the last one, the narrowing chicane and landscaping, right? A road, one of our roads that you would recommend it on so that we can connect the dots here. Okay. Um, that example, uh, if it wasn't a county road, it would kill a couple birds with one stone, and it's near and dear to your heart. Um, the area by the Hispanic market on Providence, um, uh, just south of uh, Elkham. You could put a chicane in there where you go into that area where people tend to park and make an S curb. You put a wider, you put a median, raised median section with trees or plantings or whatever, and it will slow people there. It would also not give people an opportunity to park on the side of the road and create a more larger safety problem. But that would be one of the places that I would look at very strongly. There's some other places such as on Tivoli between Saxon and Providence. I drive it every day. Um, so I hope my Saxon's not out there listening. Um, but, you know, there are a couple opportunities in there where um, the distance between the road and the sidewalk is fairly wide. Um, another form of lane narrowing and chicane is a traffic circle in an intersection. Because what you're doing is you're forcing the car to make that S curve move around the island, no matter which direction you're coming from. Um, and it also, you can have it where it tends to narrow the traffic, much like on Lakeshore or uh, the uh, 1792 along the river in Sanford, those little traffic circles effectively create a chicane. And, and a little bit of the fact that because you know, you're trying to maintain some level of speed, it feels like the pavement is actually narrower than it is. So those are some examples of where this could be done. Um, the, the next one is uh, where we they bulbed out the median to create the effect of a chicane. Um, this is just, you know, an area where you already have a median, let's say on Providence, uh, where you can bulb out a little bit from the median, then bulb out from the side and make people go through a small chicane to slow them down. If you had an area where traffic speeds are high. Uh, so that's another example. Um, the next one is actually one of my favorites. 
Um, and the intersection I think of with this is Daltona Boulevard in Normandy. Um, if you would imagine that the road to the upper right is Daltona Boulevard and you're going down Normandy, what you do is you create Normandy and Deltona Boulevard at the primary road, and then you have the other section of Normandy T-bone into that section. So you're changing the dynamics of the traffic, you're slowing them down, and you know, based on traffic studies and all that, you may not even need a signal at that location um, if it's done properly. Um, then there's intersection art. Um, in the uh, 2008 uh, document on urban design for the city, uh, there were some examples of intersection art. Uh, this can be in the form of art that identifies a village. Uh, for instance, if you're in the um, uh, a village of um, Sand Hill Crane Village, uh, this particular item in the, in the intersection could be painted or it could be done with brick. Um, you know, brick can be done in the form of, to create a rumble strip. Uh, if you've ever driven through Parks and Winter Park in Orlando where they had brick streets, um, that is a really good deterrent for speeding. Um, and when I was at um, Altamont Springs and a previous employee, I designed the area along Crane's roof that had um, uh, stamped concrete, brick pavers, we were trying to create a pedestrian friendly area and get the speed to stay down. And when you drive across those, those bricks, it rumbles. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, you are very, if you're a pedestrian, you hear a car coming, you know the look. Um, at the same token, because it, it is you know, rough and all that, you tend not to drive as fast. In that location, we use different brick patterns in the road as opposed to the brick pattern in the pedestrian areas. And we separated them with uh, what I call tree pots. They're very large pots that had trees in them. And that provides the safety for the pedestrian. Uh, it creates a pleasing environment, um, but it uses texture pavement and colored pavement in that location um, to create something that's visually appealing. Um, a lot of times when you create something that's visually appealing, people tend to slow down and take a look at it. So it effectively work, it works very well. Um, and um, the next one is a little bulb out uh, from the side with some landscaping in the middle. You can even use this landscaping to create a, um, a green garden, a stormwater garden, where some stormwater can go in it gets uh, treated with the vegetation and it goes into the, the uh, groundwater table. Um, so um, I have seen locations where water tends to stand and people tend to drive too fast. So you kill two birds with one stone. You create this bulb out, you create a swell in there for what would normally be standing water in the road. So it has somewhere to go to perk. And it's the same token, you're lo narrowing the road to uh, lower the speed. So this had many applications throughout the city and uh, certainly one that I would recommend that we consider. Um, this is just a simple gateway art, going back to what I said about the 2008 report. Um, I particularly like this one because it has a North Arrow in it. So if you're driving through town, you don't know if you're going to east, west, north, or south. When you get to the intersection, you'll know. <laughs> No, uh, hey, honey, I'm going north on Saxon. I'll be home you know, in a little while. Um, but um, this also, um, you know, because people will be looking at it, it tends to slow people down. And then my favorite, my favorite of all is lane narrowing via art. Uh, these are colored pegs. Uh, you'll notice the one closest to the road had the red and white stripes so that nobody can say they didn't see it when they hit it. Uh, the ones in back are all white. Um, but Stacy and I were talking earlier, you know, just imagine all the animals that we could try to replicate here, whether it be a gator, uh, a cow, a horse, or whatever. Sandhill cream. Um, it, it makes a statement. Because uh, people, it, 
doesn't only <laughs> narrow the lane, but people are going to slow down just to look at it. Um, so just I threw that one in there for fun. Please do not take me serious on it. Um, the next group are volume control measures. These are roads that tend to have higher traffic volume. You would like to encourage them to take other routes. Um, and this can be uh, cut through traffic. You know, you have a local street that was never intended to be a high volume road like Tivoli between Saxon and Providence. Um, and so you got four options. You got roadway closure. You have what we call diverters. We have turn restrictions. And then we have one way streets. Um, this is an example of a one way street with landscaping. You can see there are two lanes leading up to this. They brought a landscape bed out into the road to block the right hand lane. Um, and you only have a single lane the other way. Now, I can tell you that in Maitland on Lake Sibelia, they have two of these, but they have stop signs on both sides and they use the single lane to control the traffic going through. So you stop on either end, you see if somebody's coming, and then you take your turn going through the one lane section. It slows you down. Um, but the other option is just to make it one way. Um, so um, there's several options in this regard. You know, for instance, if the fire truck going through with the lights on, I think most people are gonna let them go on. Uh, so it doesn't slow them down tremendously, but it is an option. And once again, you can use this as a way to create a rain garden uh, to deal with some uh, excess stormwater, uh, water quality and that type of stuff. The next one is a traffic diversion. And what you notice here in this picture is this was normally a through four lane intersection. By putting the diverters in there, you have to turn onto a side street. You can't go straight through. And that controls, you know, it adds time for people that would be going all the way through. A lot of times with these diverters, they either have Opticon controlled devices or whatever, so that if a fire truck or a, or a sheriff deputy going by, they push a button or however Opticon works, um, it opens it up for them. It could be like a swing, a pivot gate. It would open and they can go through and uh, avoid having to slow down. But this is an option with regard to uh, controlling the volume of traffic. Um, Next one is safety enhancements. Safety enhancements are kind of a catch-all between uh, volume control and uh, speed control. Um, the first one is in pavement pedestrian lighting, uh, bike lanes and trails, unique pavement markings, greater police presence, and then fake police cars. The first one is the fake police car. This uh, car is made out of plywood. Uh, it can be engaged very easily. Obviously, we would do a little better artwork than this, um, but it is effective. Um, it could actually be folded up and put in the back of a police car. Um, but, you know, it, it is an effective technique to slow people down. When you're driving down the road and it's a long, straight road, and you see that police car up in front, 99% you're going to slow down. And by the time you realize it's a fake one, you've already slowed down. We, we've already gotten you to do what we want you to do. And typically you would play Steve where there's going to be a curve up ahead and all that. Uh, you're not going to you know the example I would use is Catalina. Uh, you got long straightaway. You put it out there in the distance and people will slow down. Um, so. The next one is what we've been putting around the city um, all over the place. Uh, there's a couple of them on Deltona Boulevard, and that is these high intensity uh, in pavement pedestrian lights and signage. Um, when there is a pedestrian there at night, daytime, because it's high intensity, you will see it even on a bright sunny day. 
but it signals that there's a pedestrian coming into the crosswalk um, and it will provide safety. Uh, one little tidbit um, is Central Florida is, I believe, the worst in the country for pedestrian safety. We have more per capita pedestrian deaths than anywhere in the country. A lot of that is because of the uh, Universal and um, Walt Disney and stuff like that. If you ever go down there, you see people crossing mid-block and stuff like that. Uh, so um, even with these lights, if somebody crossing mid-block, there's not a whole lot you can do for them. This is one that's in Toronto. Uh, this is actually artwork. They painted the crosswalk to make it look like it was floating in the air. Now you can imagine if you're driving down the road and you see these concrete the blocks a foot above the pavement visually, you're gonna slow down. Now, after you've seen them a few times, you may not. Uh, but certainly if you have roads that tend to be uh, people more from outside the area than local, uh, these are actually, and as you see, the two men on this are having fun, acting like they're standing up on a block up in the air. Um, but, you know, the, they, the studies have shown these work. And then my fun one is the McDonald French fries. Um, you can see they have the, the yellow crosswalk bars, and they look like they're coming out of the McDonald French fries packaging. Um, you know, it's... Uh, the pavement painting I was talking about before, it provides pedestrian safety. Uh, you can imagine where they could go. Um, you could also do one for Burger King and Wendy's or what have you, so. So traffic calming process. It's a five-step process. The first one would be that we would develop engineering standards that would go in our standards book that commission would approve. Um, on the various types of traffic calming that we will allow. It will have uh, requirements like traffic volumes, traffic fees. Um, it will have the whole list of things as to what criteria you have to meet in order to get a fee table or a chicane or whatever it is. Um, so that we have basically if uh, the commission was to tell me that on XYZ Street, we got a real problem. We do a traffic study. We see that cars are going 15, on median cars are 15 miles over speed limit. Um, the first thing we would do is do a, a, a speed analysis to see if the uh, uh, speed limit is appropriate. For instance, one of my favorites right out here on Providence, uh, 35 mile an hour speed zone. Um, there's virtually nothing on the sides of the road it probably qualifies to be a 40 or 45, uh, just from a traffic engineering standpoint. Uh, so that would be part of that analysis. But, you know, if, for instance, uh, well, prime example, uh, that study that we had some time ago on Doyle, where the median speed was about almost 15 miles over speed limit, and we had somebody that was doing 90-some miles an hour every day at the same time. Um, so, with those engineering standards, if we have standards for, okay, if the median speed is 10 miles over, this is the technique we use. If the median speed is 20 miles over, this is the technique we use. So it's basically a cookbook approach as to what methodology works best. In addition, when we create a chicane, if we're trying to slow the speed down by 10 miles an hour, the radii that we use through the chicane would be the radius that would be appropriate for speed 10 miles lower than what people are traveling. So that's all part of the engineering standards. Then we initiate site-specific studies. As I said before, we would do a speed study to see what is the traffic speed out there. Um, and from that, we gain information that we go back to the standards so we know what technique to use. Then we develop plans based on the studies and the uh, standards, um, we find funding. You know, we either put it in the budget for next year to be funded, or, you know, the commission could choose to put a certain amount of money in each year's budget for traffic calming purposes. Um, and, you know, we just, 
this year. We put up a number of the what I call uh, feed display boards. Um, there are a couple of them over on Norm North Normandy, um, in Catalina, and a few other places where as you're driving down the road, if you're over speed limit, they start flashing. If you're something more about, there's a strobe in the inside that starts flashing. So you know when you've been speeding when it starts flashing. Um, and then last is uh, we would install the improvements. So those are the five steps of uh, how a traffic uh, calming effort would proceed. And then last and not least is um, my suggestion if we do a series of pilot projects in next year's budget and each commissioner in my view each commission would select a pilot project within their district i didn't put it here and then the mayor can pick one somewhere in the city uh, so there would be a total of seven pilot projects for next year so that we can try them out and see how effective they are and we can make decisions moving forward i have some suggestions here um, the, the french fry cough, cough, uh, artwork on Welcome Center Way and Deltona Boulevard, right beside the McDonald's down there. Um, lane narrowing and traffic to, uh, circle on Tivoli between Saxon and Providence. Lane narrowing and diverter at Normandy and Deltona Boulevard. Uh, center line median and on Providence Boulevard south of Alcan uh, Boulevard that would force the traffic to the side of the right of way uh, so that people would not have an opportunity to park along the road. Um, and then traffic circles on Cortland, just to you know, have an area where people have to slow down to go around uh, those particular traffic circles. Those are just some that you know, came to mind rather quickly, uh, but you all may be aware of some other areas that you're getting complaints from your constituents um, and it would be an opportunity to take a look at those specific locations. So with that, I am done with my presentation and I'm available to answer any questions you may have. Vice Mayor and then Commissioner McCool. Thank you, Mayor. So I have, um, my first comment is gonna be about the uh, bumpers. I have uh, worked with uh, subdivisions who have been requiring they um, add speed bumpers to their neighborhood. And I know that the uh, results uh, from the studies that the Sheriff's Department have done, they've come back and said their roads are too, too small, they're too short for speed bumps. Um, so that's one of the things that I found out from the uh, subdivisions. Not only that, but I can understand what uh, Chief Schneider is saying, and I know that there are roads that probably do need sp speed bumps, but, but even when you're going in the speed limit at night and you don't see those speed bumps, it's, it's like a little bump uh, to your car because you don't see them at night because they don't have any uh, lights that are you know, letting you know that they're there. So you know, we can probably um, try to figure out how else they can be installed. My other comment is um, with the lane choke intersection over on Saxon Boulevard and Finland. So here's what I have, and, and I have <laughs> parked in that parking lot of Publix facing Saxon Boulevard and Finland. I've also um, studied the traffic coming out of I-4 uh, east onto Saxon Boulevard. Here's the problem. I'm not an expert, but it's traveling down those roads, even coming down Saxon Boulevard and coming out of I-4. The problem I find with that road is that there is no restrictions for the cars coming from I-4. So I know that the red line signalized says you, could, you, you, you can make a right turn when it's safe to do so and there's no traffic, right? But they don't believe in that. So you could be coming and get this close to the entrance or the exit of I-4 and somebody will come out of I-4. 
to me, that is not, is, is, is not helping because instead of giving I, uh, Saxon Boulevard enough time to clear out from the traffic that's coming on Saxon Boulevard, now you're having traffic from Saxon and I-4 coming together, which is creating the problem on Saxon and Finland, where is that merger, right? So now you have everybody trying to fight for that one lane. This one wants to keep going straight, and this one wants to push this one over to keep going straight. So my suggestion, I think, is a suggestion, I don't know, like again, is to put a circle with no right turn on the red light coming out of I-4, because this will give the traffic on Saxon Boulevard enough time to pass and get cleared out by Finland, right? So when Saxon Boulevard is on the red light, I-4 traffic is coming out, but now you don't have Saxon Boulevard traffic. That's just my suggestion, guys. I know um, I'm, I'm not trying to, uh, but you know, I've, I've sat there and I watched, and it's just crazy the way people coming out of I-4 are cutting off traffic that's already on Saxon Boulevard. So when you are on Saxon going into Veterans, High, Veterans Highway, they have that signal light. So it alleviates the traffic onto Veterans Highway from Saxon and you know, the other traffic coming the other way. So that's just my suggestion. Um, um, Madam, <laughs> Madam Vice Mayor, um, I'm gonna say something very unpopular. Um, something what? Uh, uh, very unpopular. I'm going to tell you that if I was the county traffic engineer at Finland, I would have a right in, right out on both sides of Saxon. There would not be a signal there. What I would effectively do, because we do have a grid system with streets in the area, we would force people to go to Normandy to get into the I-4 Saxon traffic because that gives them more room to maneuver. Uh, the problem we're having right now is, and, and I go through there a lot, um, you have people who are on Fentland that want to make a left turn across Saxon. Uh, they're taking their life into their own hands. Uh, one but they have a light there now. Finland, some of the other side streets. Okay, because they have uh, a light there now. The, yeah, because I just saw one today at lunchtime. Uh, they pulled right out, they got frustrated, and they pulled right out in front of me uh, because they, they saw that there was no traffic going westbound, I mean eastbound on Saxon. They didn't care what was in the westbound lane at that point. They were going. And... Um, so if, those were, if all those side streets had diverters in them, the way you can only go right in or right out, it would eliminate all those people trying to cross over, you know, three lanes of Saxon at that point. Um, and it would create a safer environment. Uh, initially, there would be an uproar in the neighborhoods because it would be a volume of traffic they're not used to. But over time, people would appreciate the fact that the traffic movement between Normandy and I-4 would be so much improved that I don't think they would be complaining for very long. So let me ask you a question. When, and, um, and I don't know if this is uh, towards the uh, Sheriff's Department, but you have a red light on uh, Saxon and Tivoli, and it's red to make a left. But then after a certain time, it, you, know, you have the, the yellow arrow. So is there a timer? or is, does it monitor the traffic? How does that work? Um, there is a timer involved based on traffic studies. Um, they have programmed in there how much red time you get on Saxon. So when you get to Tivoli, and you know, initially they give you a green light to make the turn, but at a point it will go solid yellow, if I remember correctly, for a couple of seconds. That's a signal that, hey, we're getting ready to change the mode here from green to something mm -hmm. else. After those two or three seconds of solid yellow, then it goes to a flashing yellow, and you have to wait for oncoming traffic based on manual uniform traffic control devices. And then when it's getting ready to go to red, it goes back to a solid yellow to be a signal that we're getting ready to change phase again. So it's a complicated process, but it is, um, you know, part of manual uniform traffic control devices, it's a very effective technique. Um, one of the main things it does is it keeps you from having to build an extremely long left turn lane uh, because you do get a preferred movement and you're allowed to move as traffic allows you to get across. 
Mm. Uh, no, initially, when you start splashing, that means the people going westbound on Saxon will leave, but it's usually only five to 10 cars, and once they go, you can make your left turn on the Tivoli. The other question I have on that, Finland and Saxon, there is no merger um, sign other than on the road. So if you're not looking at the road, you don't know that there's a merger coming up. So I know that it's county, but it's in the city of Deltona. Um, so I think we need to uh, push county uh, to get something like that going on and even look at the exit on I-4 in Saxon because I think that's where all this traffic on Saxon and Fitland is coming from. Sure. You, you know, you get in Saxon and I-4 all at the same time. There is no, um, there's no waiting time. Well, one so, of the items I had under safety is signage. It, was, it just simply says signage, but it's exactly what you're talking about. When you have the, what I call the, uh, the merge lane from I-4, the merge lane from I-4 goes through two intersections, one intersection at Finland. And after you get through there, you got to get over before you get to Normandy. Mm -hmm. uh, I personally wish they had taken that all the way to Normandy um, because a lot of people go in that lane thinking they're going to turn right on Normandy and they got to get back in the lane, then they go over. Um, for a little bit of money, they could add you know, that third lane all the way up. Um, and that's something that needs to be looked at long term. But yes. certainly some signage, um, preferably overhead signage. Uh, you no know, pole with a wire so you know you can see the arrows they're lit and you can see the one shows that it's merging um, that way you know you can focus on the road you know you see the signs up about 14 15 feet so the truck can get under them and that way you know which way to go because you're absolutely right um, if you're like half the people in Deltona hogging the back end of the car in front they're never going to see the pavement marking Yes. So, so the uh, intersection narrow, narrowing in Chicane, I kind of like that for Deltona Boulevard in Normandy instead of the runabout. I mean, it looks like a runabout, but I think it looks safer well, than a runabout. Uh, I'm not going to take pride of ownership on it. The uh, TPO showed uh, that as an option to a roundabout. Uh, you know, the land acquisition required is significant. It's not a runabout, but it, it's kind of it cool. it is a good option. And my last, because I hear, I hear heavy breathing around. Um, let's see. Oh, that was it. The, um, you said for the, each commissioner to select a pilot branch. My pilot branch would be the uh, intersection narrowing in Chicane, Deltona Boulevard in Normandy. I think... Did he leave? Ron left? No, well, Ron is there. Remember also that uh, that's one that we can probably do sooner rather than later because I believe we can use the Yeah, it's uh, not CRA much work. Funds. It's not much to do. Yeah. So those are my ta uh, comments. Uh, thank you for the answers. But I really want to make that exit on I-4 in Saxon a priority to be looked at. Thank Re you. Remember, we don't control that road. I have to work through others. She, he said we don't control the roads, but he has to, he can, he's going to work on it. We don't control, that we don't control the, whole, the exit. Either. Okay, but they have, they're coming into Deltona, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Bacool. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I believe that people, when they hit off of I-4, Saxon to Finland and that merge, this is what they hear. Gentlemen, start, start your, your engines. engines. I believe that they hear that because... That's the competition out there. That is the Thunderdome. That is Deltona's Thunderdome right there. Because people are like, if you're, I've thought this, if you're not stupid enough to get over, you know what I mean? And then you've been caught in that situation. Everybody knows you better get on your gas. When you're coming down there, you're gonna run all the way through. I mean, it's just that mentality. I watch it all the time too. So whatever that's worth. Um, I wanted to find out also, um, do we have, City, do we have, in, okay, who do we have that works on traffic other than you, Mr. Peters, in city? Do we have someone dedicated to, to Tom, that? Tom Kioffi and uh, Phyllis Wallace are the two primary people that work on traffic on a daily basis. Um, you know, it just so happens I have a, 
uh, a lot of years in traffic so I can talk to them and okay two things first thing is that m my first ask is that I believe that it is if we do not have it and I don't know because I've not asked this question before I know that we've briefly talked about it but I'm a strong believer in GIS technology okay Deltona is very unique in the respect that we have spaghetti roads here and resident input is invaluable as far as that goes. In my ideal world, we set up or we should have GIS technology that allows uh, residents to use and report in real time. In, and I'm not trying to be, um, if you don't know, because I have people that listen, if you do not know what GIS technology is, it's geographical information systems. And what it does is it maps problems, um, accidents, any kind of data. It's very data driven. And my, and my thought was that in having user friendly, public friendly GIS systems, people can drop a pin where they're experiencing problems. Not everyone will participate, but we will have a large pool of participation. Because it's my belief that in that respect that there are two schools of thought. There is mainstream medicine, okay, and then there's functional medicine. And we have mainstream traffic studies that we do. They do it for every development that we have come along, traffic studies. But these impacts are more functional than what they can survey sitting at one intersection looking at traffic coming and going. So that is what my ask is. I want to understand um, if that is possible for us so that residents can participate. I did an informal poll at one time and people were very forthcoming and did a, it was a small token spreadsheet about where problems were. Is it speeding? Is it racing? Is it accidents? Is it pedestrian safety? All of those issues can be addressed at one time and grab that data. Again, I'm very heavy on data. Second thing I wanted to know is what uh, if um, VCSO has um, GIS that they use for Delta or, or that they use and some feedback what VCSO believes might be some problems that they see or solutions, both problem and solution of what a recommendation coming from first line people that are on the job. So if that can be answered, that would be fantastic. Um, if I could address both of them. Sure. Um, the GIS system we have here at the city is pretty robust. Uh, just in the public works department, uh, we keep information on uh, the payment raising system. That is the process in which we uh, do our um, evaluation of all the roads in the city, their condition, that condition information is put into GIS. So we can create a map that shows, you know, red hot are the ones that, you know, got to be paid. Yellow is the ones that get near ready to be paid. Then green are the ones that we got several years before we got to worry about them. <clears throat> um, the other element is um, I have not been wanting to put this out in the public, but you asked the question. Um, when we do the meter installs, uh, the data from the individual meter coming back into the city will utilize what's called a NAS system, mm -hmm. NAAS. Mm -hmm. It is like having uh, I don't want to use Wi-Fi, but it's basically a wireless um, mm -hmm. uh, data stream. Um, right now, everywhere but the Walmart area has 100% coverage. We're going to need to put either the NAS antenna on our tower at Public Work or put another tower such as at Eastern Wastewater Plant. Then we'll have 100% coverage in the whole city. There are third-party applications. Uh, where you can put a miniature G, um, GPS system in a vehicle. It's really not GPS, but it's part of the NAS system, where you can look at a computer screen and a map of the city and see in real time where every city vehicle is. That same system, you can have uh, speed monitors on certain poles at certain locations that data will go back into our computers so we can have real-time speed information on certain roads. 
the display boards that I was talking about. Those display boards could transmit data through the NAF system to where we will have that information. We have already talked to the Sheriff's Department about the, the ability to do that. Um, you know, one of the things that we're looking at is, um, I know part of the rental program is there will be a certain pot of money out of the whole thing that would go toward policing. And I'm hoping that some of that money can be utilized for innovative um, ways of dealing with data, such as what we're talking about with speed and all that. So. And, and thank you. That is fantastic. These are, again, city-driven solutions, right? And I am looking for the participatory solutions also so that residents can kind of feel empowered because part of this is communication and being heard and listening to understand as opposed to listening to reply, right? So I would like the residents to have some input here. That data has to be captured in order to make it relevant and in order for us to budget for that. There's city driven and I understand that, that's our responsibility. But there is also our responsibility to listen to the residents. If there are add-ins, plug-ins, whatever that we do, I want that to be so that the residents can put that information in. I see that Orlando has GIS technology that is user-friendly also, where people can drop a pin. You can drop a pin on a map at any time and see what is going on in, say, Deltona. There's software there now that would allow you to see, oh, it is um, Friday night, right? Where is a concentration of noise complaints? It makes response times better. It makes it, if there is a one person that has a grudge against a neighbor, um, it'll show you that repetitious nature. If there are multiple neighbors calling in on that call, you can see that also. It's data driven, so you look at data at a glance, and that's why I said I wanted to hear from VCSO also what they believe some problems and solutions are from a ground perspective as well. the Volusia Sheriff's Office here. Um, so as far as your GIS question, I am one of the most non-technical people you'll ever meet. Um, that's the joke with my deputies is they gotta fix everything for me. All right, I'm a hammer and nail guy. I can tell you that as far as all the data, um, we get all the speed studies. We do our thing looking at where the problems are. Um, but as far as interactiveness, I'm not aware of anything on, that I know of. Um, our IT department, I believe, works with you guys as far as you know, all the data. Um, the, the speed signs you know, and, and flashing lights when you're going too fast, um, any type of visual aid when, when people are driving. And the, the example I always use is Cotton's Corner at I-4-995. I don't know how long you guys have been here. I'm a Volusia County cracker. So I grew, I was born and raised here. Um, I-495 was a terrible intersection. I know that's not Deltona, but my, my point is, is that as it got worse and the traffic volume over there increased, they started doing uh, uh, visual aids as far as narrowing the lanes, um, adding oddly spaced hash marks on the side of the road. So visually in your, in your peripheral vision, you thought that you were going too fast coming into that corner and it slowed a lot of people down and it cut down on wrecks there um, until they redesigned that, that interchange. Um, I hope that kind of answered your question. I mean, it, it didn't really answer it, but at least, uh, you know, it, it's, it's hard for me to comment on that, the, the technical side of it, because that's not what I deal with a lot of the information sharing. Um, I can comment on everything that Mr. Peters said as far as his list of traffic tables and speed humps and whatnot, um, if you'd like me to right now while I'm up here. Um, the, uh, and I made some notes while we were talking just so I don't miss anything. The, uh, the speed humps, um, I've been at the Sheriff's Office since 2001 and I've been in law enforcement since 1997 here in Volusia County. And the city of Daytona was the main ones that began using speed tables, speed humps. Um, 
And they worked for a little while. Um, they mainly used them in the, the complaint areas. Um, and they worked for, in my opinion, two years. But then the residents that wanted them there at these streets, and, and, and the reason why they, a lot of them were put up was because of all the just the enormous amount of speeding that happens in Daytona on side streets. Um, the, they worked great, but then that created other problems where the speed hump was on, let's just say, Center Street. Well, now everybody moved over to Third Street mm -hmm. to travel. So mm -hmm. then they had to go put, and you know, then they had to go put speed humps on Third Street. Well, then that blew everybody out because they were using those side streets to get to Mason and, and Nova and US One. Then that increased the volumes at peak traffic times on the main roads, and it, cr it created more crashes because of left-hand turns. Um, left-hand turns at intersections are, are probably a top two reasons why we have crashes. If we could get rid of left-hand turns, you'd cut down at least 25% of the crashes. On Saxon, like he said, right-hand turn only from Normandy to, to Finland, that would, that would eliminate a lot of our crashes, especially at the Finland area. Um, the, the visual aids, you know, the, the barricade or the uh, delineators that are up in the center median, those are great because they're a visual aid that somebody sees and they're like, oh my gosh, you know, I don't have 12 feet now. Now I only have 11 feet. And that foot, you'd be amazed, makes a huge difference on people's driving habits. Um, the, uh, the lane narrowing is a big thing. Um, the, uh, the bump outs, um, the bump outs work that I've seen in my opinion. Um, the speed, the, the raised intersections, my opinion is the intersections work, but that also creates another problem. If you have them in a major intersection, if you try and get a piece of heavy equipment, a low boy through there, they can't go through. Mm -hmm. Because if you raise it more than six inches and a low boy tries to make a right-hand turn, you know, they're going to bottom out. Um, so now you've just created a three-hour problem waiting for a Class A wrecker to get there to pull, to pull the thing off. Uh, you know, road narrowing, visual aids, the landscaping and the chicanes, those, in my opinion, around Deltona are are probably going to be our best bets from my traffic, my traffic opinion. Um, the other thing we got to remember is that Deltona was built on the design of maybe 30,000 people, and we have 100,000 people. You know, so inherently, you can only flow so much water through a funnel. You know, I mean, it, it, it gets to a point where either the roads have to be wider to accommodate the volume um, or put more traffic lights in to, to slow people down, but you can't put a traffic light, you know, every block. Um, enforcement, somebody brought up enforcement earlier. Unfortunately, enforcement is a, uh, a huge deterrent. You know, like on Howland Boulevard, if you get a $460 speeding ticket, you know, that's going to slow people down. Um, we're not going to get everybody, but it's going to be a deterrent, you know. We're doing our best with the resources that we have, uh, at least of the traffic guys, to be out there at all the speed complaints. I just took three traffic complaints, you know, from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. today from residents of, of problems that I was not aware of on side streets. Um, you know, one of them was using the city's website of the traffic calming uh, report. Um, and in fact, I had never seen that until today. <laughs> I found it today while I was talking to her on the phone, looking, trying to help her with answers. Um, but, you know, the, the, the ideas you have are, are, are good. Um, they're going to cost money and they're going to take time. It's not going to be an overnight, an overnight fix. But I do think the chicanes and the visual aids, as far as, you know, trees on the side, trees in the medians, you know, to create that effect of you're going faster than you are, that's going to slow people down. That and education, um, either, you know, by them visually seeing how fast they're going. Because a lot of people between their phones, you know, talking to their kids in the car, listening to the radio, they're not paying attention. But if, they, if it looks like they're going faster, a lot of people will slow down. Um, your example of right out here on Providence, uh, how fast today? 
How long? 70, 70 miles an hour. And the kid had no idea he was going that fast today. Um, he had a suspended license, so we dealt with that. But that was right out here in front of, you know, in front of City Hall. Mm -hmm. So this would be actually a prime example of putting a median or something in there, you know, to slow people down. Because I can tell you, I come off the hill, and I'm sure every one of us have done it. You come off the hill, and you start pushing on the gas pedal because you see this 100-foot wide right away, you know, with, with no visual aids. Um, mm -hmm. So that's my two cents. And you guys got any questions for me? Did you have anything else, Commissioner McCool? No, thank you very much. And uh, that comment's been made to me before by someone talking to someone about speeding because that's been I, something I've been jumping up and down about. Um, and they say, but Commissioner McCool, y'all just laid that nice asphalt out there on Providence and it's really nice. And that is a, a matter of it. And I know that Mr. Peters and I have talked about this. I've talked to um, the sheriff about this in a meeting that I had regarding enforcement and and in speed control measures, yeah, I can pray that somebody runs over speed bump and bottoms out when they're trying to speed through a neighborhood. Practical though, no, for emergency vehicles. So I'm absolutely on board with the volume control measures and the safety enhancements. One of those safety enhancements being that what I t talked about in that meeting was the level of service required for Deltona as far as traffic. I know that we talked and I turned that information over to the city manager and it's something that we have to talk about as we continue to populate because you just heard the, the deputy there talk about this was built for 33,000 people and we have quadrupled that with real no um, safety enhancement to protect the people from from that kind of thing so that that's all I wanted to bring up enforcement we're gonna have to when we're talking about budget comparison you know what I mean budget comparison for enforcement versus uh, control measures. So I just want us to think about that and be serious about thinking about GIS where it is participatory for the resident. It, and it doesn't have to be limited to speeding. It can be limited to other issues um, with different colored pins for different issues. But I really want us to think about that. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Bradford. We guys answered a lot of questions, but I still got a few. So understand the analysis what I'm looking for is you know when, when the sheriff's office was doing kind of each district you guys did a great job on sending us some statistics um, when you put this information together mr. Peters did you get from the sheriff's office a list of where they felt was the, the most problematic where you know like I, I can tell you my district like I can say okay come sit at my house and it's XYZ time, you're gonna hear the going down the road. You know, Highland, Norm, I mean, I, I can name my areas, but these guys deal with it on a daily basis on, like you're saying, you know, Providence, we got a little bit of problem with, you know, um, XYZ, we have Howland. I mean, and, and I'm kinda at the point where it's like, okay, I understand the whole lane narrowing but I look at lane narrowing kind of that's going on right now between, you know, the whole, was it LCAM down here to Providence? And we still got cars going 130 miles an hour. So it's not that, that to me, it's like they're just going to get used to it and they're going to they're gonna hit that speed again. I, I think he nailed it. It's hitting the pocketbook. You know, it's, it's slapping them with these $400 tickets and <coughs> let little Tommy take a $500 ticket home to mommy and daddy and tell him he was doing 70 and a 35. Um, yeah, good, sorry to say, but you know, it's either him or we've already had a couple pedestrians killed this year. And that's, that's the whole point of this. So I'm guessing, you know, like he's saying, this is a long term. We need something now that's a, do we have readers that will, like you were saying before, do both, you know, where we have the, um, the device that shows their speed, and if they're XYZ over, say 10 over, it takes a picture of their license plate, is that legal? <clears throat> do you guys know? Commissioner. <clears throat> um because I know with the deputies, they have to have a visual yeah. of the speeder. So I don't know. 
if that device, because you were saying we have those devices, yeah. but then somebody said, it's not going to hold up in court because these guys actually the have to visually on, see the it. The piece on with the camera on the back cannot be used for enforcement purposes. However, that information, you know, if you send a letter to the owner of the vehicle based on the tag saying that this vehicle was clocked on this date and time at 21 miles an hour over speed limit. This is your first warning. And then at that vehicle, we can work it out with the sheriff, I believe, to where the sheriff's department would get that information. They put it into their database. So if they pull, if they have a letter on file that John Peters on April 1st got a, you know, a notice in the mail that he was doing 21 miles over speed limit on uh, North Normandy. When John Peters is driving around Deltona and they pull me over for you know, six miles over um, or 10 miles over, when they pull my license plate, that letter that I got will be no on there. That letter will serve as my warning. So the likelihood that I would get off with a warning that day would be slim and nil. Um, so while it's not directly enforceable, it can be part of an enforcement program to where there's a shorter trigger for people that have a history of getting those letters. So you're saying by you sending a letter, it's gonna pull up on the sheriff's system. If we were to work with them to do such Is a Is that thing. legal, guys? Do you, do you want to come up to the mic? Thank you. That way it's Sorry, Lieutenant. clear. A little longer winded answer than I expected. <laughs> um, very vaguely, what he said does sound like um, it would be legal, but the discretion would still be up to the deputy that stopped him. So, generally speaking, what he's saying is the city would send a warning. The city of Daytona Beach did something like this as well with uh, prostitutes. Uh, if they couldn't enforce it or whatever, they would send, they called them Dear John letters. And you know it was uh, it was posted up in their database and things like that, knowing that hey, we have we have you on our radar. That would basically be what you were talking about, but with speeders. Um, however, the enforcement of the on the tail end of that, if we stop somebody and they had a, a warning, it would still be up to the deputy to write a ticket or not write a ticket. Um, it may require some roadside investigation, talking to them like, did you get this warning? Were you the driver? Things of that nature. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's still going to be at the discretion of the deputy. We wouldn't automatically issue a, a citation simply because the city sent a warning and it was in our database. Okay. Does that answer the question? <clears throat> and then I guess, you know, like I said, my, my biggest questions were making sure we're hitting the areas that you guys see the most action in. I mean, you guys see exactly where the action, I mean, we're getting letters from the residents that are, know how to contact and know where to vocalize. But what you guys deal with is everyday real life, let's right. just say. So, I mean, so you guys have, know the real life areas more than we do. Right, we get a bird's eye perspective because we, we get it from the whole city plus the county areas of the unincorporated area of Deltona. Um, so we get a bird's eye perspective on the entire city and there's various hot spots that come up and as we address them, they no longer become hot spots and the hot spot moves somewhere else or the priority level changes and it goes somewhere else. Um, there's no shortage of places to enforce traffic uh, in the city of Deltona. Um, as we apply pressure, it tends to break. Um, it stays broken for a little while, they slow down, and then more complaints are generated or crashes pick up and we have to readdress the problem. And so it's constantly fluid. You know, right now, um, you guys issued what, like 70 citations in the construction zone within two days, three days, something like that, uh, right on Howland. Uh, that was over a handful of hours worth of work. Um, and they just went right back and did it again and again. And it ends up slowing them down. Uh, we will break that area at some point and then the, we'll go and force elsewhere and the problem will probably reappear. Yeah, and, and, and that's, that's the problem. I mean, they're just gonna get used to that, mm -hmm. the, the different driving patterns. You know, I'm okay with us, thank you, Lieutenant. I'm okay with us doing, I mean, I love the idea of pedestrian lights in certain areas, I think that's important. Um, I do like the lane narrowing and landscaping in certain districts and areas. Um, the intersection art, I'm going to be honest with you, John, 
<clears throat> as much as I love your humor, I don't like the French fries. I don't want, I want art, but I want tasteful art. You know, to me, that's tacky. I don't want to be known as the French fry art city, you know? Um, that's not what Del Tone is about. So if you're going to do that, please don't do French fries or a cheeseburger in my area, okay? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Ron, I might leave yeah. this one to you on the art they side. They want to sponsor it. Uh, listen, listen to this. Please don't and put French fries more. on yeah. Howland, Normandy, Graves. Okay. Yeah. Please. Yeah. You, you, good. But I think something tasteful, I get it. Mm. You know, when I look at the raised and the beautiful art there, I'm going to be the one that would slam my brakes on and then have, you know, five cars behind me in my rear end. So <laughs> I want it. I, I do agree with that, but at the same time, I also think of, you know, you get a new driver in that area, they're going to hit the brakes and they're going to be rear-ended. And then is the city going to get sued because we put that there and we cause that accident because we get sued just from dropping a pencil wrong, you know? So those are things that it's unfortunate I have to think that way, but I do think that way. You know, could it cause an accident? Could it cause? Yes. So... I guess that's the analogy I think of is do we want people to slow down too much where they're gawking and then they hit somebody or somebody hits them? So, I mean, the art's great, but are there going to be pros and cons to it? You know, you could put French fries down, I guess, and increase sales at your local fast food chains, but I just, I don't know, to me, just keep it in no district. I'm good. Okay, Vice Mayor and then Commissioner King. Just have a... a Quick question. I don't know if uh, Mr. Peters or one of the uh, sheriff's representatives, do you know which is the most dangerous street in the city of Daltona right now? Do you consider? Harlem Boulevard. Mm -hmm. okay. We've had, in, le in less than a year, we've had, uh, well, maybe about a year, we've had four on, on the entirety of Howard. And, 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 and I have to put this out there real quick, Mr. Peters. Um, us commissioners up here and staff are trying very hard to uh, bring solutions to the speeding here in the city of Deltona and and just control the traffic. But many times, and I don't go on Facebook a lot, but there are times that I go on Facebook and I'm being warned of speed traps. So, you know, this needs to stop as well. It, it doesn't help. If, there, if you're not speeding, you shouldn't worry about speed traps, right? Um, so if you are one of those people, please stop. It's not helping us. Uh, fix the problems of speeding on our roads. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner King? Uh, Mr. Peters, I, I don't think that now is, I don't think there's an answer for this right now. Um, but when we talk about um, road narrowing and putting in vegetation and trees and so on, um, I think we better be careful in the preparation of that to check, prob I don't know, I think it's going to be probably state, maybe statutes, because I believe that there are um, limitations on how close a permanent object like a tree can be from the edge of the road. Um, I have heard of lawsuits against cities um, and counties because people had accidents in these kind of situations where there was a tree within so many feet of the road and it was an encroachment into what the law said and they sued the city and the county for having yes. a tree too close. or a permanent object, whatever it is. And we start putting trees and all of that, which I would love to see, but to have them so close, 
may cause us a problem too. So when we begin to design something, I think that all of that should be looked at very closely before we um, make a um, decision. Yes, sir. Um, in my previous employee, I have done the engineering standards based on the DOT's uh, road and bridge specification. Um, they have very defined standards as to, based on the speed of the road and the nature of the road, how far the tree, like if you have a tree in the median, uh, typically it has to be four feet from the curb, but it depends on the type of curb. If it's a mountable curb, you got another, add another two feet. If it is a straight back curb, then it can be four feet. Um, same thing for sidewalks and trails. So one of the first standards that we would put in place would be those criteria that we're talking about here, which is how far the tree, how high can the shrub be, 30 inches. Uh, that's typically the standard unless it's a depressed median because cars, the driver in a car is considered to be the eyes at 3.6, uh, three feet, six inches. And so the shrub cannot block their view of anything at that level. So there's a whole set of standards on that. Um, I can tell you in the past, it was a one sheet chart that defined everything from sidewalk, for instance. Um, you know, people don't think about this and anybody's been on a bike trail, you know what I'm talking about. Um, technically, the, the ball of the tree has to be at least seven foot six inches above a bike trail. Because when you're sitting on top of a bike, you know, your head, if you're a tall person, is going to be about seven foot six, especially if you're on top of your paddle paddling because, you know, you don't have enough leg strength to get through there. So, you know, it even covers the height of the, uh, the, the crown of the tree. Uh, so, yes, I'm very familiar with that, and it would certainly be part of our standards. And th those standards may even um, drive the size of the of the mediums or s whatever it is you're putting mm -hmm. in. Is that correct? <clears throat> okay. So um, I have a couple of questions. Commissioner Bradford, did you have a question? Yeah, if you wanna go, I mean, I'm writing my thoughts down. What I'm trying to figure out right now is, you know, how we, we have a new million square foot facility coming in off of Normandy. Um, which is going to put even more congestion on the Howland Graves Halifax Crossing, which is a major concern, obviously. Um, what amount of funds are going towards that, that intersection and what are we doing? Because right now, to me, that's like a major priority because how long is it gonna take for that million square foot facility to be done? Are we looking yeah. at nine months, eight, nine months probably? Um, well, let me address that. As you know, we put in the budget uh, to build Rhode Island from Normandy around to Howland um, on the back side of the high school. Uh, that is a centralized intersection. What people are going to figure out very quickly um, that have businesses such as um, I-4 uh, Logistics and any of those businesses in that area is you will be able to go up Rhode Island to Howland take a left and get on I-4 in two signals. You come out of the southernmost entrance of um, Amazon, you'll have, to, eventually would have to go through four signals to get to I-4. And signals is what drives the timing. So people will learn very quickly to use the Rhode Island corridor to get to Highland in I-4. And, and what that in turn will do is it will reduce the amount of traffic at Graves and Howland. Well, then that's that's great for I-4 residents, mm -hmm. but you have individuals that are heading down to the other end of Howland. You've got major subdivisions off of Howland Boulevard, and you've got workers that are gonna be going all the way down the 415 route. So not everybody, a lot of people steer away from I-4, and they, they'll be heading going down 415. So they're hot telling it down Howland and taking a right on the 415, right? So that's not gonna stop that traffic. So we're still gonna have a major flow of traffic on Howland Boulevard. 
You know, right now I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest. I get I get that's my biggest nightmare is not so much the graves in the Halifax, but just even the residents coming out on La Lolly right now. You know, they can't get a light because we got a light at MLK. They're being told by the county, oh, you got a light at MLK, but you know, you guys can just, you know, cut through the subdivision and go down, right? It's gonna get worse. And right now we're being controlled by that. So yes, you're right, that's going to assist with the individuals hopping on I-4, but it's not gonna assist your local traffic that's going to that area. So that's my concern, is local traffic living within Deltona that's not jumping on I-4 to go to these jobs. They're yeah, the ones that are cutting across, coming down Providence, going down and, and cutting across to the other areas. So. I, I agree with your concerns. I that's have the same that's a major concern. concern for me. Just met with Mr. Paradise and staff last week. Uh, we are talking about doing an overlay district on that section of Howland from I-4 um, down to Providence, I believe what we agreed on, uh, so that as property develops, that we will create techniques to help the traffic get in and off of Howland in a more efficient way, whether it be a reverse frontage mm -hmm. road or what have you. Uh, so uh, we want to bring in a uh, consultant that specializes in the planning of this type of roadway section, create an overlay district is basically another set of zoning criteria over and above what the base is. For instance, in the city, if it's C1 zoning, pretty much unless you have two or three entrances onto a road, the overlay district may say, not only do you have to have one, but you gotta combine it with the adjoining property so that both parcels only utilize one entrance and the existing crossover. Uh, that will reduce the amount of traffic conflicts along the road. And so those, that is something that we are looking at. Uh, we were planning to bring it back to the commission, um, probably in the budget uh, for next year uh, to do some, uh, we also are looking at the potential of doing an overlay district down on Deltona Boulevard uh, because we got some unique circumstances down there with lots that are undersized. Um, and you know, what methodologies do we have to improve parking opportunities so that people can redevelop property down there at a reasonable cost. So those are things that we're looking at. And yes, um, we agree with you 100% and we ha just had a meeting specifically what you're talking about. Okay, so then the other problem takes us back to Finland. So from, let's say the industrial area, um, now I'm gonna come out, I'm gonna go right, I'm gonna take a right on Sullivan, and I'm cutting through on Finland. Those cause extra traffic on that area as well. And I believe that has increased um, as well. I think there was talks before about Somebody had mentioned, Ron, I don't know if it was you or who it was, about possibly even cutting Sullivan off. You know, but, but you're going through, again, a very residential area. Cutting through Sullivan and Finland, you're cutting through the area. And these guys, I'm sure, will probably contest too. It's a great little speed area. It's a great little, like, and then go, and then they, they kick over just to get to that Saxon to then kick to I-4. So we're bringing in big businesses, which is great, but we also have to figure out how to deal with the problem issue before they're done. And so right now, I think it's vital that these are um, addressed immediately before that million square foot facility is done, because if we've already got a problem now, it's gonna be 10 times worse by doubling the problem. You know, so it's, you know, it's not just coming over to Howland, it's, it's the cut over from Sullivan to Finland Normandy to Saxon, and it's, you know, it's the local people getting from, like you're saying, point A to point B within a city that was made for 30,000. Mm -hmm. So that's that's our biggest obstacle. We're a city made of 30,000, not everybody's hopping on I-4, and we're always thinking about I-4, I-4, I-4. It's not all I-4. A lot of our people that are working these local jobs, they're local residents, and they're the ones that, you know, we got to to figure out how to get them to and from safely. It's not always speeders, guys. 
So we, we've got to resolve that. I mean, and these guys, they're, they're kicking their butts right now. You know, they're doing as much as they can. You constantly see them out. I do appreciate all the road stops and traps. And I'll be honest, I'm not one for dummy cars. I know another city was actually sued for having a dummy car because they ran to the car waiting to get assistance and it was a dummy car. So, and I think a city was sued for that. So I'm not one that's big on dummy cars. I mean, I'm all for everything you guys are doing as far as your speed setups, your traps, your awareness. And like you said, you know, they're gonna go to one area. All they're gonna do is go around you and go to the other area. And then you go to that area, they're just gonna find another area. I mean, they're smarter than we are. So I, I just think we need to address this issue Sure. sooner than later with the businesses coming to that industrial area. Okay, I would like to remind the commission that the DOT plan for I-4 beyond Alterman uh, includes a, um, a minimum of a bridge at Rhode Island and the potential for an interchange. Now, DOT has expressed some concerns about the proximity of Rhode Island to 472 in Saxon, um, but if you go across the river, um, at 46A and Sash um, and Lake Mary, you basically have a frontage road um, next to the interstate mm -hmm. where those interchanges come off. Um, and what that does is it, it narrows the requirements for the separation between uh, interchanges. So the ultimate goal is that we will get a fourth interchange in the city of Deltona at Saxon. That alone will reduce some of the traffic on Saxon, some of the traffic on 472, because people will have an alternative location. For instance, if you lived off of uh, Sport Smith, off of Elkham, the most efficient way for you to get home will be to get off at the new Rhode Island interchange, take a short section of, of Normandy over to uh, your house, as opposed to getting off at Saxon and coming up um, uh, North Normandy and up Elkham. So it will give people new options that they currently don't have. And uh, so that will help, you know, certainly at Saxon. Um, you know, the uh, internal joke is that the only way to fix Saxon is basically build a bridge from I-4 up to past Normandy up on the hill. And that way people have a direct route to get over past all the local traffic. Um, that's obviously too expensive, uh, but as I said, that was a joke. Uh, but building a new Rhode Island interchange is not a joke. Uh, we have support from the county and Orange City and ourselves to put that interchange in place. Uh, so you know, our hope is that that will be sooner rather than later. Good. Commissioner King, and then we'll wrap it up real quick. I'm going to ask a couple of questions after Commissioner King. We don't have to wrap it up, but I have a couple of questions. We're talking about traffic tonight and how terrible it is and how we need to slow people down. And we've got too much of it, and it's here and it's there and it's everywhere in the city. We have a traffic problem. Let's remember that our traffic problem is also a road problem. We have roads that need to be fixed and we need to have a louder voice at the TOP to get county roads in this city fixed. And by the way, while we're talking about having all this traffic, why don't we just go ahead and approve another 2,000 homes in Deltona? So we can just add to the traffic problem we got. You know, somewhere along the line, we have a problem here. And we don't talk about the problem we have here that's going to impact this problem we have already. And somewhere along the line, we've got to come to a balance on all this stuff. So I just think that we should keep that in mind moving forward. I've got a road in the first district. You all know which one I'm talking about. Lake Helen Osteen Road needs to be fixed. There's new holes in it all the time. 
It's the worst road in the city. And we will soon have another 6,000 trips on that road with either already approved or potentially uh, potential projects for a couple more developments. But let's just go ahead and right now just worry about traffic. In the back of your mind, I want you to remember that more development brings in a whole lot more traffic as well. And we need to think about that moving forward. I'm, I'm, I think we need to fix our traffic problem. But one of the ways we might think about fixing that is to slow down on some of the development we're doing too. And that's all I got. Thank you, sir. So listening to this hour and a half of conversation, it's a general consensus that we have a traffic issue in a lot of parts of the city. And looking at your solutions for some of it, um, some of the solutions like like the gentleman, the, the, the deputy said, putting a, you know, nailing people for speeding on Providence or here or there, you're just basically moving the traffic, moving the issue around the city. They'll, they'll slow down for a while and then you go to another, it's, it's a never ending cycle of trying to catch people that are speeding, that are running red lights, that are, you know, doing doing things, passing in a, in a, in a non-passing zone, it happens. And is it right? No, but it's a constant problem that is not gonna go away. We can enforce and enforce and try, and it can slow down temporarily, just like what you said about the speed bumps in the different areas, I mean, in different parts of the city, they will find a way around it. If you put a speed, I mean, years ago, a neighbor of mine up the road felt there was too much traffic coming down the street and wanted speed bumps, and they did a, the city came out and did a traffic study and did their little you know thing on the road and discovered, no, there, there was not. There weren't that many cars going by with a high rate of speed, and it was down a hill. And if you would have put speed bumps there, I mean, it would have been like a real problem. And a perception of that one or two people coming down your road speeding every day is definitely a problem. But that's why we have Commissioner McCool to your point data. Um, when we look at the whole picture of the city, to me, we have certain things that we can do that can be long-term, longer-term calming measures. And I've seen them work. I've seen them work um, on Granada Boulevard, on e um, eastbound Granada Boulevard before you hit Beach Street, that whole downtown area. What they did is, is they did tra lane pinching and they did the landscaping and they put a median in with palm trees. And that road was, was not that wide initially, but it was a lot, a lot of people speeding and getting backed up at Beach Street, having to go over the bridge. And when they did that, at first, there was a year of hate. Oh my God, the traffic, we gotta go slow. Can you believe this is ridiculous? But when you go through there now in that commercial zone, you know where to park. You know that they have the little landscaping curves that come out, they have the median, they've considerably slowed down that, which is twofold. It gives the businesses there a better visual. You can slow down and you can see where your businesses are. And you can also have less problems when people frequent those businesses and cross the street. So my point in saying that is when you look at some of our business areas, this is for Mr. Peters and Stacy and Ron, when we look at where we're gonna have some redevelopment redevelopment, I'm not talking about what you're talking about, the new uh, bigger um, logistics. When we talk about redevelopment, right now we're talking about redevelopment in several different areas. Right now the Bethune-Cookman campus on Saxon Boulevard is being redeveloped. The area on, there's an area on Deltona Boulevard that's being redeveloped. There's, there are other areas that people have bought, either older buildings or they're taking certain things and turning into something else. Is there the possibility that internally we can look at where some of those business areas are? And at one point, uh, a donut place was looking at coming at Elkham and Providence. And those would be some of the areas where you have redevelopment that you would be looking at maybe putting some of those calming measures in. It would slow the people down the traffic down, it would, it would give it a little more management and it would give those businesses a chance to be seen, in other words, in, a, in a, that type of a redevelopment area. For new development, new commercial development, that should be a build-in. All that should already be done. And a big thing is the, the houses that were taken down at Normandy and, and Saxon. When that gets developed, whatever it may be, 
There have got to be traffic control devices put on that interchange. It's horrendous. And that needs to be a stipulation, to your point, Commissioner King, of development. Development is not going to end. We already know three different areas where they're revamping things. And, and four, hopefully, on Enterprise and Deltona Boulevard. And if, and if that dead gas station and the three homes there that were with the house next doors, if those start coming up, you're going to have an increase in traffic. And you've got to manage what's there with those kind of things. So if we can look at from through permitting and building what's coming in and also when we talk about repaving roads and looking at roads, when we start looking at those internally, is it possible at that same time to get the data for crashes and for speeding and everything else before we resurface a road and put all that money into fixing a road? Is there a possibility to look at data and say, hey, this might be, or community need, this might be instead of while we're going to resurface this, let's go ahead and see if we need to do any calming things or do we need to do some landscaping while that's going on? instead of going in a year later and ripping everything up and then saying we're going to do this. I mean, maybe as forethought, maybe we do that already. Those are just a couple um, of ideas. And also lane pinching, I-95 and US-92, when they redid that intersection, they definitely did it to pinch the lanes to slow. And what happens? Traffic backs up on 95, up to LPGA. On a daily basis, well, I shouldn't say daily, but you have to pick your poison. You either slow the traffic and have a lane backup like Saxon and I-4, which I completely agree, that's a problem, or you don't do that and you have the constant speeding and people trying to get where they're gonna go. So it's a, it's a trade-off. It's definitely, to me, a trade-off. Um, when you look at um, art, the art, the road art would be great, again, in some commercial areas to, to get an, a visual and upgrade maybe some of those, those areas if we can do something like that. And the last thing, um, speed bumps, I don't know, I, I've never been a fan. I understand the concept. Maybe the brick rumbling thing is better, like change the texture of the road, because that always gets me to slow down if there's bricking there, at least in a residential area. Um, the city of Deltona was originally built in those three pockets, but was geared at the time land-wise for about 75,000 people. Initially, the original build-out was about 30,000, but land-wise, it was about eh, 75,000 people. And right now, when you look at the demographics of the city, as a retirement community, you were looking at two people in a house. And now we have multifamilies in a house. We have very, I would like to know how many really have two people in a house compared to the number of multifamily, multi-generational families we have, the number of people that are renting out rooms, right? That are renting out rooms that, that bring in extra traffic, that are renting their RVs in their backyard and charging 600 bucks a month to live in the RV, building out their sheds. All that brings extra traffic extra and extra people into this city. So the other, other thing I wanted to touch upon, and, and Commissioner Ramos, I don't know if you have any comments since Commissioner King brought up the TPO, but funding, funding for this, I will agree, it needs to be a priority to look at some of the areas that when we work with VSO that are, are the problematic speeding areas, and we know Deltona Boulevard is one. I mean, that thing is what, five lanes? And some of the areas, you know, when it hits Normandy, it's like five lanes, right? Two, two, and then the middle, right? Two, two, and then that middle thing. And they love to race down that way. And then you have the other, like you're talking about, those side streets where people just go through. and. Um, I think that community meetings are a high priority. I think that we need to put that in because it shows that we're trying to get community input and we really are. We want to hear what the residents have. So everybody up here had great ideas. Mr. Peters, what is the next step for this? Um, simply put, Madam Mayor, uh, if there are consensus from the commission 
uh, we will begin drafting some engineering standards um, for various types of uh, traffic calming devices that we have talked about. Uh, their application you know, in terms of speed differences and stuff like that and we would bring those standards back to the Commission for approval and that would be our bait our our Bible as to how we handle traffic uh, calming going forward the city right now does not really have strong code with regard to how we handle uh, traffic calming or any of the fee controls and that type of thing so we would be standardized just like what you saw with city of Atlanta and city of Dallas and you know, some of these large cities have traffic calming uh, handbooks as to how it's applied and, and that type of thing so that if a resident calls up and says I, I want a roundabout at uh, Deltona Boulevard in Normandy uh, we can say well that doesn't meet our criteria but a diversion um, chicane combination does and um, you know we can uh, try to inform them on that and ultimately budget it and build it so commissioners um, you're asking for consensus correct um, do we have consensus first of all and then Commissioner Ramos um, if you want to say anything about the TPO do we have consensus first to move forward with some um, solid design standards and so forth. And the last thing I want to say, because I see my board is lit up with four, um, to address the problem of county roads, to address the problem of county roads. The reality of Providence, it just got paved about three or four years ago. <clears throat> we all know it needs to be widened. The oil intersection is terrible. It's, it's just rutted up to, to, to Normandy. The reality is it's a 10-year project. Whether the county has it, whether we have, take it over. To, a, to accumulate property and everything else and, and right of way and, and everything, it's a minimum of a 10-year and a multi-million dollar project. So that's the same with, with Lake Helen Osteen Road. I don't know what that is, but there has to be a way for the Deltona City Commission to make the county council aware make the county council aware that at least a road like Lake Helen Osteen Road that goes from city to county is a problem all the way across. And that's on us. That's on us as elected officials to talk to our county representatives and say, <laughs> you know, but I mean, go, go to a public meeting. I mean, if that's something, you know, draft a statement. Someone go to a public meeting. Bring some visuals. If we really want to do that, that's what people out here do for us and make us aware of the problems. So I don't know. That's just my suggestion. So, um, Mr. Peters, do you want to, should we just have consensus or we want to go down the board real quick? Go down the board? Ramos? Unfortunately, in a workshop environment, we can't vote. So you right. need to be a consensus. Okay, you, know, then, you can do it by voice vote on the consensus. Okay, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll, we have four on the board. As you wrap up your comments, indicate how you feel about the consensus. Commissioner Ramos, McCool, Bradford, and Vice Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. As it relates to the TPO, trust me, uh, Commissioner King, those conversations are constantly happening. Unfortunately, sometimes it's about time and projects that have been on the pipeline for a while. I can tell you, as much as we're excited to almost have, or we're supposed to have Holland done, right, which is a county road and it was supposed to be done in January, obviously there were some challenges there. Um, but I have to tell you, it's a constant chess game. Um, and we continue to, to voice our, our opinion and, and, and work with what we have. Um, as it relates to consent, I, I think absolutely, um, I like the concept of maybe um, putting together some pilot projects that we, as we talk about our budget. And for me, when I think of District 5, I think of Humphrey, I think of Montecito, um, areas where people have requested um, those speed bumps. And it's always been that conversation. Well, for safety purposes, it's not what we want to do. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm for it. Um, but I think um, maybe creating those pilot projects in the different areas, um, and they don't, maybe we can choose what to do, something to do to scatter it and do something different to see what's working. But as it relates to speeding, 
it's just gonna continue to move. It's a fluid situation. You're gonna stop it in one area, it's gonna go to another area. Again, it doesn't mean we, don't, we want to stop doing anything, uh, but let's just be realistic about it. Um, I'm, I'm for us probably creating or Mr. Peters bringing back some pilot projects that we can definitely look at as we talk about the budget and see what's cost effective so we can move forward. And Thank design you. standards as well. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner McCool. And there's absolutely consensus from me and that with the note that I would like resident input to be considered when we're doing this, when we're doing pilot programs, we need that data. I, and I understand that withstanding the 311 that we have, it's a different type of um, GIS data that I'm requesting. The GIS data that I'm requesting is real time functional data, meaning that, again, the comparison between functional medicine and mainstream medicine, right? How it works on a daily basis um, because the residents that live there have that input. So whatever that looks like, um, what, whatever we have, whether we want to, IT wants to put together a, a poll or a, whatever we have to do in order to move those projects forward, but we need that data from directly from the residents in a participatory way, however the city manager sees fit to do that. I entrust you with that, you're the engineer, but I really want that data. Well, Madam Commissioner, if I can address that, um, you, you're making me extremely nervous for two reasons. Um, you talked earlier about you know, quite a bit of data. Um, it's easy to gather the data. It's a whole nother thing to analyze the data. I mean, to talk about the level of data you were talking about at the beginning of the meeting would be a minimum of two staff people. And quite frankly, I'm not sure the data is going to provide what you hope it will. Second of all, and as it goes back to a comment that Commissioner Keene made about the separation between trees and this type of thing, that the protection for us in the court system is to follow accepted engineering principles that have been proven to be a safe method. I get very nervous about opening up engineering to the public. Um, there's a reason that engineers have to get a professional engineer's license, um, to show that they have the uh, the expertise and all that to make sound engineering decision for the public safety. And that is one of the key things regarding professional engineers. And I'm sure Mr. Fowler would tell you that if there's a lawsuit involved, we want to make sure that we're following sound engineering principles to protect us in such a lawsuit. So, I just offer that. With, withstanding that, and I understand that completely, I'm not a professional engineer, but I am a professional resident. And when I say I want people's input, that's exactly what I mean. It, it doesn't, listen, I don't believe that it costs us two staff members to put together, I don't care if it's an informal but data-driven poll. I understand what I am asking for. You and I have talked about this before as far as um, GIS technology. We've talked about that. It doesn't have to be that complicated. We overcomplicate things sometimes. I am asking, however, for resident input as we go along because there's gonna be areas in our city where we don't have a problem. There's gonna be areas where we think we have a problem and don't. I wanted to spell that use of time that we might have by collecting that data. So I understand going through data. I understand data-driven decisions. I understand data as it regards to engineering. I'm asking for data so that the residents have input and are able to inform us where they see they have issues. And with the amount of districts that we have here, can be simple, it, 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 I'm sure that with your engineering background, you can figure out something less complicated for us regular folks. I have all confidence in that, sir. C Commissioner McCool, what kind of data are you specifically looking for? Because I'm kind of, maybe you have a conversation with him, but I'm kind of lost. So there is software driven data that residents can participate in. Report a problem, it drops a pin on a map. It's a visual cue. Okay, so you're asking, you wanna have some sort of a, a, 
a program that residents can say at 123 Oak Street, there's a speeder that comes every day? Perhaps, it, depending on, yeah, I want, I want feedback, residential feedback. It can be as informal as a poll, but we need to understand, if we send traffic engineers out, and a traffic engineer sits, say, at the corner of Providence Boulevard and Saxon Boulevard, they collect a data set, period. That's how they do traffic engineering. Mm -hmm. Traffic coming this at the four corners there. That's where they collect the data from. They are not collecting the sampling data from those side streets. They're not sitting there and doing that if we do large-scale traffic engineering. The input is just as simple as three people, four people on Sullivan could say, we have a problem every day at this time, and that, that can be addressed. But informally, before you do when you're doing this, it's going to take resident input also. And how do you how do you want to get that resident input? I guess that's where I'm seeing like, do you want to have like a, a survey sent out? Do you want to have a mailing sent out to every resident? Do you want to have like an email or do you, you want an app? I, that's kind of where I, I just. That is up to the, the city manager as he sees fit to allot his staff's time but I'm simply asking for input. He is going to understand he has been doing this long enough. You have consensus for me, short answer, absolutely to do this with the request that we get residential data back because we can't collect the information that we need. A survey would be fantastic, sure. I, I'm sorry, Madam Mayor, I'm not trying to be difficult, but oh, I'm no, I'm just to trying to understand data. like the process to collect the data. That's just and what kind of data you want. The, yes, sir. the city manager and his infinite wisdom, I'm sure, will come up with something. And, Madam Mayor, if I may just jump in, just question, not question, but a question that I would have in reference to that, then uh, what type of time frame are we looking at? Uh, number one, number two, uh, once we get the results, we get the results or, or you know, are we then going to go back and forth? So I'm OK with it. There has to be input. I'm okay with it, Commissioner, but at some point in time, we have to make a decision on whatever we get or whatever information or time frame that we have on it. If we have four complaints, I'm using Sullivan just because it's mentioned. If we have four complaints from the people on Sullivan Street, but yet we have 87 complaints from people that feel compelled strongly enough to report in from Ferrandina, I think it's something to look at. That's all I'm trying to do is it's a visual cue. That's what I'm asking for as we move forward. Then, I, then I would suggest you have to include all the data that the, the Sheriff's Department just said, that they're the ones that just said, how many complaints did you deal with today, sir? You Three complaints you dealt with today. So all that is gonna have to be part of the package because just what calls us or what puts somebody puts on social media or sends an email in, I, I'd like to know how that compares to what they receive. Uh, looking at the list, we were looking at three today. We have 21 just for the traffic units handling, not including the ones going out to the patrol units. 21? Yes. For in what time frame? Currently active. Right Currently now. active right now. For just today? No, no, for like the last two months. Okay. And, and Madam Mayor, I, I, last thing, I'm just trying to be socially conscientious here of our residents, fiscally conservative in where we put those funds because we're talking about budget, and hearing our residents, listening to them not to reply, but to understand where those resources are. That's all I'm asking. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Bradford? So a question I have is, do you guys have a system? Does the VSO have a system that they're got, that you're using already? So instead of us having to go through, I don't know, Sergeant Lieutenant, maybe one of you guys can answer that. So instead of us trying to figure out how to do it, if you guys already have a system, why fix what's broke? So do you guys have, like she's talking, some GIS mapping similar? Not to what, I, I understand what, what you're, oh, you're I totally understand what too. she wants. We don't have anything like that. I mean, we do have, uh, you know, we have our, our non-emergency and our 911 that you can call in. Um, we do the city forwards, uh, Mr. I always mess his name, Kiafi. Kiafi, yeah. Kiafi. Um, he sends me emails of the complaints he receives, which I'm sure you see, Mr. Peters. Um, so we have a system. It's not the, the GIS where somebody can call and make a report, uh, you know, what, like what she's explaining. Um, that system wouldn't be a bad idea. Um, it, it would, it would definitely quadruple what we the, the complaints we get. 
but part of my job, if y'all aren't aware, is is to between me and my lieutenant, um, you know, and based on my city's not you know the city knowledge, I've been here, I've been in and out of working in Deltona since 2001. So I mean, I the complaint areas don't really change; They're, they haven't really changed other than we get new streets and more residents. Um, so we we filter through them and we try and check all of them. Um, the ones that the, the traffic unit goes to are the, the more serious ones. The other ones we, we send out to the patrol deputies to go, you know, because some of them could be at night. Uh, I only have one guy at night working the traffic unit. Um, so he, he tries to get to the ones at night, but as far as uh, the data acquisition, we don't have that yet. We still, I hate to say it, the old school way. You know, just phones or emailing them. Okay. To me. Would you guys have a 12 month analysis input of like, and I'm just going to use my drill, so say, Helen, um, you know, how many incidents in this area? So it would help break down, in your guys' opinion, the most critical areas that you've like, hey, we've tried to combat this, we get it under control, and as soon as we leave, it's back to this that, you know, you may be able to refer us to some areas. So, I mean, I, I'm for it, but I'm for doing it correctly. I don't want, it's, it's not us up here that can guess what areas need to be done. That's between staff and VSO, in my opinion, because you guys have to deal with it. Yeah. Oh. So our, guy, our job is to work with you guys, in my own opinion, on where do we need to reduce traffic incidents? Where do we need to reduce the speeding? Where do we have the biggest concerns and problems? Because as our staff may deal with some of it, you're dealing with 90% of it. So, I mean, I'm for it, but I'm for you doing it with a good analysis with the VC, um, VSO. Okay. Um, Mayor, commissioners, it is, it is, it is, seven, it is, it is, it is 730 and commissioners, I have uh, Vice Mayor, Commissioner Sosa. I need to go to Commissioner King yet. Can we extend this meeting by 10 minutes, please? Because we have public comment and manager comment. Gotcha. All in favor? Aye. 10 more minutes. Can you, Bridget, can you do a timer for... 10 more minutes just to let us know. Okay, you were good. Um, I will, let's go Vice Mayor, Commissioner Sosa, and then Commissioner King. Okay, so I'm gonna do this really quick. So, and, and I, I understand what um, Commissioner um, McCool is asking for. Right now, the, the way I'm handling it for District 3 is meetings. I meet with the residents, uh, usually HOAs, they're giving me their um, issues with their local streets. For example, Piedmont in Finland, they're 25 miles an hour, they were complaining about speeding. There are signs in there that you come out of Publix. It says do not enter, people still enter and make that shortcut into Normandy, right? So I had a meeting with, at that time, was Captain Marino. Uh, and, and Mr. Peters, we met, we came up with a, a solution, he put a, um, a deputy out there on a motorcycle, and I mean, it was successful. He, I mean, he, I think he must have used two books of tickets, but um, it, it, it helped. And I still ask questions, and people saying, no, it, you know, things have really slowed down on Piedmont and Finland, and people are happy on that. So, right now, until something comes up, I guess we're just gonna have to meet our district and our uh, residents and, and, you know, feed that information in there. My other question real quick, Mr. Uh, Peters, the, um, the idea that I liked for the intersection narrowing in Chicane on Deltona and Normandy, now that's part of CRA, so that doesn't have to go on the budget this year, right? Um, technically, it would need to go back to the CRA board for approval, uh, because the CRA board is technically the only entity that can start that process of using CRA funds. But, you know, we can come back and give the commission a report, and then if you all want to go back at the CRA board, we can do an agenda item for a CRA board meeting. So it would be just like an update to the yeah. CRA board, right? Yeah. Uh, because it's the, the budget is there. Uh, the last money, CRA... Money is there. There is some money for the study, which I believe was being done through the TPO. So I don't know how much money is left in that account at this point. So what you do you been doing with my money? 
You've been spending my CRA money? <laughs> <laughs> you approved it. <laughs> no, well, um, seriously. That was, that was the match portion. Most <laughs> of it is coming from the TPO. Okay, but I, you know, that was just a question since this is this will be part of the CRA project. But thank you, thank you for the update. Are you for or are you for, I'm for. the design standards and so forth? Okay, Commissioner Sosa. I have a concern with the pinching and the chicanes because as we mentioned with the fire trucks, when we have bigger fire trucks going through there, how are they gonna be able to navigate through there? How many streets are we actually looking at adding these to? Um, I can tell you as a spirited driver in my youth, a chicane is not an obstacle. It's actually a little incentive to try and get through it quicker. So I, I think what we need to do is, is gear more towards enforcement as opposed, and, and I'm not talking somebody going a couple miles over the speed limit. I'm talking some of the issues I have, somebody going 140 miles an hour down Howland. Th those are what we really need to be focusing on. It, it's not the person going 36 and a 35, it's the folks that are exceeding the speed limit double digits. Um, yeah, my main concerns while I have the sergeant here for the traffic unit are from Cortland to Fort Smith on Howland. Every Friday and Saturday, that becomes a racetrack. I know I've sent numerous emails because I get complaints about it all the time. It usually starts around 8 p.m., finishes about 1 a.m. Um, other concerns are Fort Smith, India, and Cortland in general. So I, I think those are the areas we really need to focus with. I'm not sure pinching is a solution. I'm not sure adding chicanes is a solution. But I, I would be okay with moving forward to try and find a viable solution, and it's more to target more the aggressive, overzealous drivers as opposed to just the general driving public. Because remember, when you start pinching and slowing traffic, especially as we add more traffic, what are you going to do? You're going to create congestion. And instead of now we're trying to slow everybody down, now we've backed everybody up. So I think we need to look at the whole picture of it. And I don't want to work backwards because we just took um, LCAM from, or no, Fort Smith from LCAM to Providence. It was a narrow road and we extended it. So we spent all that money widening a road and now we're talking about making roads narrower. So I, I think we need to figure out what we're gonna do before we actually start throwing money at anything. And I, I would be okay with pursuing, you know, ways to do it, but to make sure they're going to be beneficial down the road and not going to inhibit us, and we're going to have to go back and redo what redo. we just did. Mm -hmm. Commissioner King, consensus? Yes. Okay. And myself as well. Um, anyone else on the board? No. Okay. Mr. Peters. Any comments? And we're going to go to public. Do we have anybody signed up for public comment? No, Madam Mayor. Okay, then we'll close public comment. Uh, just very quickly, um, at the last meeting, um, you all gave permission for staff to work with uh, Commissioner McCool and Commissioner Sosa with regard to a meeting here for social service groups. Um, after meeting with Ms. McCool, um, it became evident that it wasn't what I expected. So I have suggested to her that she conduct a workshop at the time that she planned, uh, the city's involvement will be less. I spoke to Mr. Sosa and he concurred. So uh, just want to let the commission know that staff is not going to be involved in this meeting regarding social services and Ms. McCool will be handling it as a workshop. Okay, no other comments? Everyone good? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being out there. Chief, everyone from VSO, we really appreciate your input and we are adjourned. Uh -huh.